Hello, gracefully chosen community, and welcome to Foster My Stories, the achievement-focused podcast for foster care, adoption, orphan, inclusive of underserved communities. I'm your host, Shalina Michelle Tate, and on today's cast episode, I'm so excited because I will be interviewing Wanda Littleton. Excited to have her on Foster My Stories, but before I get into the dynamics of what she does, a little bit about her background, upbringing, and what yep. led you into uh, what you do today. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me be able to share and get the awareness out about the needs in our state in regards to all vulnerable children. And so thank you. I grew up in the upstate. I grew up in a great home, a very loving Christian home. My mom and dad were foster parents, so I grew up with foster siblings. And so that was a huge part of the DNA of our life. And so not just having foster siblings, but then being involved in other community events, whether it was a local children's home or caring for people in crisis. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a chemist. But they modeled the importance of caring for people in our community. And so that was something that we did as a family and was taught to do individually. So as I grew up, I knew that I wanted to go into the field of caring for others some way. I majored in psychology and had my first job at the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Commission in Pickens County, where I was a school interventionist. Mm -hmm. And that was a great Mm -hmm. position. Also served on a church staff. And that church staff position led to me going back to school and getting my master's and then eventually my doctorate in education and going into church uh, vocation full-time throughout the years throughout my journey that emphasis uh, continued in regards to caring for people in the community here in South Carolina as around the world and also foster care and adoption continued to be a part of the DNA that I was taught I have three foster children they've all been returned home one son and two daughters my son and one family I still have a connection with as well as one of my daughters and her family I have a connection with and so that's a huge plus I think in regards to fostering. I've spoken to a few other guests as well that's said how their parents have modeled much of what choices they made growing up into going to career. How was it having foster siblings already being around that around a young age? Well it was great for me and it was very early I think not necessarily early to foster care right because we've been DSS has been around since 1947 so I'm not that old. It was in the 70s. It was in the mid to late 70s that yeah. my parents were foster parents so a lot has changed yes there's, there's a lot of things that are done differently in some respects and some things are done the same so it was a good experience for me and my older brother yeah. we had a sibling group one time the boy and girl were in between me and my brother's yes. ages we had them for a long period of time and so that was that was exciting because they were our brother and sister and, and then their mom came back in the picture and it, things were a lot different then in regards to how children were returned home And so um, there wasn't much of a transition. And I know probably some listeners are saying today where there's not much of a transition of children being returned home. But anyway, my parents did a good job of celebrating with me and my brother and our foster siblings that they were going to get to go home. Parents did that well. And uh, what we didn't do well is because we did not know the term disenfranchised grief had not been coined. We did not even know that it was okay to grieve that loss yeah. because it was a celebration. Yeah. Know that they had gone home. And so that would be one thing that I wish that we yeah. knew then, what we know now about the importance of grieving well and grieving loss with the child when they come into your home and then grieving as a family when they leave yeah. your home. It's something that we've learned across the years. In regards to the experience, every single experience was a great experience. Parents were always very positive. I don't really know there were negative Mm -hmm. things. I know there were some challenges with some of the kids who came into our home, but my parents treated them, again, remember this is the 70s, so my parents treated them just like that they treated us. Yes, yes. And so yeah. you can't necessarily do that same form of discipline or whatever today. We didn't see any different in them. They got in trouble. They got the same trouble yes. punishment <laughs> as we did. I commend you for highlighting the fact that, you know, your family took in your, your foster siblings and they were basically family and everybody was treated the same. And you're right, yeah. it has changed over the years because I came up in the 80s when I was placed in foster care. And even now I know that it's changed since the 80s and what you were mentioning about your family commend the dynamics of the fact that your family was a family and your sibling your foster siblings were your siblings as well it was an equal thing was that much of an impact on what led you into wanting to go into the field that you're in now and doing what you do in the service overall yes yes okay. i think they had a huge impact and i think just uh, them modeling that and again 
again, you know, they did model that yeah. family. We all celebrated together. Yeah. We all, if one of us was hurting, then we were all hurting. Yes. And so I learned a lot of empathy and importance of being able to empathize. And yes. I know there's, you know, the definition of that is you have to have been able to experience what they have experienced. But I think my parents, to the best that they could, they did teach us that. They yes. taught us that when our foster siblings were sad and why they were sad, is really understanding why and sympathizing with them, but also to a deeper level of being compassionate. So I learned a lot of principles that we should all yes. live by and sharing, right? You know, yeah. when they would come and go, then we were no longer a family of four. Sometimes we were a family of six yeah. or five. Yeah. Or one time at Christmas, uh, parents were asked to take them. I think it was like a sibling group of seven. That's sibling awesome. group of seven. It was just supposed to be just for Christmas. Yeah. That turned into like for three months. Yeah. I was very young at that time. Yeah. A lot of resources had to be shared yeah. during that time. And so everybody shared the same resources. Yeah. The same mom and dad, whatever was given, yes. treated the same. That's dynamic to hear that you even was able to have the seven siblings. I know even now, right, it's hard to even get two siblings in the same home most of the time. It goes into the preference of the foster and or adoptive families. You're majoring. Going to the studies of saying, hey, this is what I want to do for my career. Did that come later? How did that lead into that? Well, I think that did impact um, what I wanted to do. I, so I majored in psychology and so I wanted to go into a helping profession of some sort. Okay. When it came time to do an internship, my advisor got me connected with the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Commission and so I did an internship there and fell in love with it, and which worked into an immediate job right out of college. That was in the 90s. The job market was, um, it was difficult to find work right out of college during that time. So I was very fortunate, uh, very blessed to be able to do that. So, so I didn't pursue an internship with DSS, but today we champion and have a huge part of the nonprofit that I'm a part of, which is a home for me. And the focus of a home for me focuses on kinship care and teens that are aging out of care. And we do a camp every year, a trauma-informed camp called Journey Camp for kids, foster care, or adoption. So that's kind of a specialty. Another part of that a nonprofit is we are huge advocates of child welfare professionals. And so I think my role today is championing child welfare professionals. And I think I was taught that my parents were always very, very respectful of social workers who came in and out of our home. We lived in a small town. We had one caseworker that I remember for every child that came into our home. Going on to heaven, Mr. Lively, probably close to six foot five, which we thought was a giant. Wow. So Mr. Lively would come into our home and are the foster siblings, and so he treated me and my brother too, just like uh, <laughs> the same, you know, yeah. we came to love on and to check on the foster kids in our home. He yeah. loved them and checked on us, so we didn't know that he wasn't there for us. Yeah. We never Aww. knew. He did a good job of including us into whatever he was doing. Yeah. And he was just like a giant jungle gym, I'm sure, yes. to every, every child that he went into their home. Yes. So. Well, I love his name, and he sounded like he was a dynamic individual. So just putting that together with his personality, glad to hear that. Really, mm -hmm. there was a, a dynamic caseworker that came in and out. And I imagine that that's also the process for what you do with a home for me. Am I saying that right? Who's coming in as far as counseling and uh, connecting with the right resources. Could you tell listeners a little bit more about Home For Me? How did that start up? Yeah, sure. So Home For Me started as a ministry in a Simpsonville, First Baptist Church Simpsonville. In 2006, we were just beginning to think about what would it look like if we developed a ministry where families could be supported and encouraged and uh, in their walk with foster care and adoption and developing a formal ministry in our church. So in early 2008, that was uh, launched from there. Uh, I think it was probably around 2014. That became its own separate nonprofit. And now it still exists as its own uh, separate nonprofit. And the focus now, pretty much a support network yeah. for uh, kids that are aging out of foster care. So we've yes. been able to help connect teens with resources, whether it is they need a microwave for their apartment, computer for school, help just with rent payment just until they can get established okay. or maybe even connections with jobs and people that are hiring or maybe connections that we have. The other is um, kinship care. So okay. yes. there are a lot of family 
kids mm-hmm. across our state. Thankfully, the law was changed where kinship care is now. Families can be licensed and they can get board pay for kinship or fictive kin. But there's still a lot of things that yeah. maybe some people choose not to be licensed, which is fine, whether you're licensed or not licensed mm-hmm. in kinship. And if you need uh, maybe help paying for a summer camp or yes. cheerleading camp or sports equipment. There's mm-hmm. some families right, that have been kinship care providers for okay. their grandchildren and like when their yes. grandchildren turn 18 all they want to do is be adopted and so we can help financially with that cost of adoption. Getting connected to lawyers who will do the adoption for the fee of what it would cost to pretty much the, just the paperwork and registering that court documents and so because sometimes that's still I don't yeah. know minimum of $3,000 and that's a lot of money and so helping to provide that for the families so they don't have to pay for that. How is that process for like siblings? So say for instance, if someone had a brother and sister, would it be that per child or would that be a total cost? I think it would just be like the adoption of the children into, it might be a little bit of a charge for just if there were additional court papers that had to be processed, okay. but just the cost of the adoption. They didn't do all the adoptions at the same time, then it would be course it would be additional charge each time thank you for expressing that amend really a home for me uh that's a blessing that that started really with a discussion in the ministry especially for homes and individuals and they're wanting to go into foster care adoption and it sounds like that service uh, was birthed from love and a real questions of well how do we as faith-based individuals families and groups really give back in the community so i like the fact that that became questions and considerations and then that sounded like a huge blessing that it carried forth to a, a full nonprofit where then you could help more and then I also like the breakdown of aging out which is also a huge issue of course when a foster child and or adoptive possibly if they age out depending on the home and the situation a lot of times 18 tends to be the number they don't really have the resources or understanding of what they're going to do next I like how a home for me for them to still know they have resources out there because aging out could be scary especially if you don't really have the right mentors or the right people in your ear or any encouragement or support and also how you spoke briefly about kinship care so listeners also if you are desiring to become a foster parent i encourage you to check with your local town city state and the requirements for that especially if and of course i'm pretty sure if you was to contact a home for me they could explain that in further details resources and time were unlimited how you said support uh, the teens aging out and provide more for kinship care families especially those considering adoption and those are two huge and how you said on the website so true 400,000 children still needing help in kinship care whether they are aging out or whether they're just wanting a home along with the camps that you are currently working on for the future uh, that you wanted to progress with um, a home for me yeah thank you Thanks for that. Yes, the camp. So we do have Journey Camp, and you can go on the website, ahomeforme.sc, and see there where you can sign up for Journey Camp. And so that is the end of June. So we have two camps, kids camp. One is June the uh, 28th and 29th. That is for young elementary school kids. And then June the 30th and July 1st is for older elementary school kids. And that's all listed out on the website. It's a free camp. The only thing that we do ask is parents also are required to attend a TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention, training, parent training. I will contact you and ask which training you would like to be a part of. But all the camp information, registration for camp is on there. Any questions, you can always email me at Rhonda at a home for me dot SC and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have or help you out there. So camp is a big thing that's coming. That's a big thing that's coming up. The other, and this is kind of a cross, not just special to a home for me. This is really a training that's a great training, a trauma-informed training that's coming up nationwide. There's a couple of different dates. The one that a home for me is sponsoring is going to be in Simpsonville at Summit Church uh, April the 23rd. Hope for the journey, I think is the exact phrase of that theme, and I knew that Chapman Bob Show Hope are hosting that this year. It was formerly known as Empowered to Connect. We are doing it live Friday the 23rd of April, a nine-hour day. But I think you can go on maybe the Show Hope site or Google Hope Journey Conference and see where there's different ones all across this Friday, April the 9th, uh, when it is being simulcast out of uh, Nashville.
Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you, Ms. Rhonda, for sharing that information as well. So listeners could be aware. Visit a home for me, S-C, spell A-H-O-M-E-F-O-R-M-E dot S-C. Look through the information that's there provided about the trainings that's coming up. Also, basically about the program, uh, Home For Me and what it all does. Ms. Rhonda, I also see that there's 15 slots. Is that for both the camps, groups, or just one? That is 15 per camp. 15 okay. 15 slots per camp. 15 slots per camp. So if you're interested, please reach out as soon as possible to see if you can get your child registered. I think that's going to be a great camp for both you and your child. And contact Miss Rhonda as well at a home for me dot sc and see if you can meet her. Miss Rhonda, before we go, is there any advice you would like to give to potential foster and or adoptive parents or anybody wanting to look into kinship care? Yeah, I think that training or just reading the book, the connected child or the connected parent. Both of those, Purvis and Cross. Doctor Purvis was. Uh, instrumental in helping to write to the connected parent that those two resources I think are huge if you are looking to step into the arena of vulnerable children and the brokenness of where children come from hard places and really just understand how we are all created differently but because of trauma that also wires our brain differently we've all experienced some form of trauma either acute or chronic yes we have all experienced that and so I think just those books are a huge enlightenment to everyone about how brain development and how our brains are wired and the importance of connection. Also the importance of uh, really as adults our own attachment style, knowing what that is, right? So if you've been in this arena any at all, you've looked into that, you understand attachment is huge. And so you begin to think about what is your own attachment. Style. And so you can study that and you can look at that at TCU, Texas Christian University, the Karen Purvis Institute of Child Development is a great resource to help you unpack what your own attachment style is. Yes. And just knowing, I think the biggest thing, big takeaways for me that I learned is that not parent the same way you were parented. I, I had great parents mm-hmm. and I was parented very well, but you were parenting kids from hard places. You can't parent the same way. And uh, the importance of a attunement and mindfulness is huge in that connection. You can't walk into whether it's foster care, adoption, or our kinship care and uh, not be 100 plus percent connected to the child that comes into your home, even if it's an infant. Even yes. infants, they have experienced trauma, and so their brains are going to be wired differently. And so I think if you just get your mindset wrapped around that and understanding that the best news is that our brains are plastic and our brains can heal, there is hope for all of us. But it does take intentional connection with the child that God allows to come into your home. Thank you so much for highlighting the attachment and getting with your families and helping them understand, especially when there's foster siblings or new siblings that's there, and then if they will return to their families, how to deal with that as a family, which are very real topics as far as understanding um, personal attachment and how to deal with that. Um, very real topics. And Ms. Littleton, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here on Foster My Stories. It's been an honor. You are definitely a dynamic leader, and I commend the work that you have done and still do here for so many youth needing the right guidance. And if you would like to be a featured community or a special guest here on Foster My Stories, please inbox the Gracefully Chosen 2020 Facebook page. You can also catch new content on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and hear these episodes via Red Circle, Audible, Spotify, Republic Radio, and Google Podcasts. Miss Littleton, before I go, one more thing. Do you have any um, that you have, any services, products that listeners can also reach out to you pertaining? Website. We did do a quick little, just a little book about home for me. It's just a fun story about kids coming into foster care. They can check about that on the website. But also the website lists other books and okay. podcasts, okay. things that we feel are good resources for families as well. And listeners, please go check that out at a homeforme.sc and go check out the content. I believe you're going to definitely benefit from it because it is gracefully chosen. And remember, being fostered, adopted, orphaned, or underserved simply means 
you're gracefully chosen. Ms. Littleton, you have a dynamic rest of your day, and you as well, listeners. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. It's been great being with you. Thank you. Thank you.